Cool. So let's get started. Let me just give you a quick introduction about myself. I'm Srikala. I'm one of the co-founders of Trackable. I have been uh, in the IT industry. I worked with HP for a long time. Uh, post which is when uh, you know I focus completely on crack verbal. I'm also part of the ISB Goldman Sachs Women of Entrepreneur Program, and I'm also part of the Cherry Blair Foundation, where I where we help women entrepreneurs, uh, you know, in, improve in their businesses. And let me introduce Pradyut Anand, our uh, speaker of the day. Uh, Pradyut has been with us for, you know, pretty much throughout our journey. So Pradyut, if you could just introduce yourself and take us through your journey from here. Sure. Thank you, Shrikala, and good morning, everybody. Uh, I'm an alumnus from the Indian School of Business, graduated in 2008. Prior to joining ISB, I had about four years of work experience in the IT space. Post that, I have uh, I've done both management consulting and corporate strategy. Currently, I'm a sales programs manager at Dell EMC, uh, based here in Singapore, looking after our Asia Pacific and Japan region. Uh, overall, I have worked in North America, Europe, and Asia. Uh, so a fairly wide set of experiences across a multitude of industries and geographies. Awesome. Thank you so much, Pradyot, for joining us today. And I think uh, we are really looking forward for this session. Uh, just sure. to give you a background, a little bit more about Pradyot. Pradyot has been uh, a mentor with Crackwell since almost, uh, you know, 2011, 2012. And he has been a mentor helping students, almost over 2,200 students uh, throughout their application journey. Right. So thank you so much, Pradyot. Uh, so uh, Pradyot, you know, just to get us started, tell us a little bit about your pre-MBA journey, about your experience before your MBA and, you know, how, how did the whole thought of an MBA come to your mind? Sure. Um, so like many other people of uh, my generation, I graduated in the early 2000s with a degree in engineering. I did not go to a top tier engineering school. It was a local school in Bangalore that I went to for my engineering. I was in BMS college, if anyone knows that. Um, post that, I got into Cognizant through campus placements, worked there for a very short time, six months, then moved to Oracle Hyderabad, where I was an applications developer. Uh, so my first two jobs at Cognizant and Oracle were in pure software development. So I was basically a hardcore IT coder did that whole thing for about two and a half years after which I wanted to change. So I applied to SAP uh, when they were recruiting. And the interesting part is they were actually looking for software developers. I just walked into the interview, cleared it. And when they finally made me an offer, I said, look, I'm looking for something other than software development. So is there anything that you have? Uh, the person was kind enough to connect me to what was called the application solutions management, which was the product management division within SAP. And I made enough of an impression on the recruiting manager there to get hired into a team where I was the only non MBA. So I did two years of solution management slash product management, which involved obviously looking at the product, figuring out new features, etc. But also in terms of uh, field sales enablement and marketing in terms of talking about some of the new features, the rationale for such releases, etc., with customers and partners. And that's really where the seed of an MBA came into my mind, because as I mentioned, I was the only non MBA in my team. So while I understood the technical aspects of the product, I was not as effectively able to articulate the value of those products using customer stories, personas, and tying it to the outcomes that a customer desires from their business. I had a tendency to look at it from the technology coolness factor rather than from the view of how does it help a customer solve their business problem and become more efficient or profitable. While I learned some of that during the two years I was in SAP, I realized that if I had to sort of grow in a non-technical role, which is really where I wanted to be, I needed to get a better and more holistic understanding of all parts of the business, not just the technology pieces, but everything starting from strategy, finance, marketing, operations, sales, 
supply chain. And the best way to do that was uh, in a formal way was to go for an MBA. So that's really how I uh, came up to the MBA journey. And uh, that was my motivation to apply uh, when I did. Right. So, Pradut, you were around four and a half years experience is what I understand by the time you applied Correct. for an MBA program. Okay. Okay. So, uh, why sales? Like, what, what, do, what is the whole thought process behind taking a career in sales uh, post your MBA? And if you could just tell us a little bit about, you know, the whole sales aspect of it also. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, it Okay, so let me upfront state that, you know, when I went to an MBA, I didn't really uh, say that I'm going to go into sales. I was looking to go into management consulting. Uh, sales, however, is the one thing that's common across every single company, irrespective of industry and geography, right? If you don't have customers, if you don't have somebody paying for your product or service, you basically don't have a business. So sales is the unifying glue that exists across every single company and in any geography. Now that said, after my management uh, consulting career, when I decided to move back into industry, I initially started out in the corporate strategy division at uh, Hewlett Packard and then moved to a similar role here at Dell. Um, the move to sales was sort of uh, a bit of, I would just say it happened because Somebody I had worked with closely made a transition to sales. Uh, and when they wanted somebody else to support them, they brought me into the role. So it wasn't really a planned thing at the start of my career that I'm going to go into a sales or a sales uh, ancillary role. It is something that happened along the way, but it's something that I've spent time in now for about four to six years. Um, and if I have to say that there is one domain of business I understand well after strategy, it is sales. So, uh, Pradeep, more around, uh, you know, so what exactly, uh, you know, uh, especially post your MBA, what exactly does a sales prefer? What are they responsible for? Uh, okay. typically? Yeah. So there are two kind. if you think about it, there are two sorts of um, paths, even within sales, right? So one is pure sales where you are the salesperson. So if I draw an analogy to a cricket team, you have the team itself, which consists of the players who actually go on the ground and play the game and either win or lose. So if I take a, if I draw that parallel into the corporate world, the sales reps are the players. However, there is a whole set of additional people who are responsible for ensuring that the players are able to do what they do. So this could range from the, uh, you know, ball boys, linesmen, etc all the way to the team coach, the physio and the support staff who exist. So similarly, while there is a sales organization in any company or a sales force in any company, there is also a supporting group such as sales operations, uh, sales programs, etc. So I'm part of the supporting organization now. So I don't have a quota myself anymore, but what I do is I support Dell EMC's sales reps in order to go and hit the number. Now, in terms of the sales rep, the it, it's actually very simple. Every sales rep, if you are a hardcore seller, you basically have a number to hit, which is your quota. It could come from one or many products, depending on the kind of industry you are in. You could have a sales territory, which means a geography within which you can operate or you might be structured based on industry or vertical. Again, there are many cross combinations possible depending on the complexity of the company that you're part of. But essentially the sales professionals are the ones who are responsible to ensure the continued running of the company. If the sales reps don't perform, there isn't enough money for operations to pay salaries or for the company's continuance. It's as simple as that. Right. Sales cures everything, as they say. <laughs> <laughs> or it can be the problem for everything, depending on how it goes. Right. So uh, one more aspect of it. So, uh, you know, when you're talking about a career in sales, what do you think is, uh, you know, so what kind of, uh, you know, is there a DNA required in terms of the kind of people who should be focusing on a career in sales or, uh, you know, uh, what do you think is a typical, uh, you know, qualities that you think a salesperson should have when they are looking at a career in sales? Yeah, and that's very important for anyone who's looking at 
frankly, any career is to understand what are the sweet spots and what are the traits I have that will make me successful in this. Specifically for sales, you need to be somebody who is very goal focused because at the end of the day, your performance is very black and white. If you hit your number, if you met your quota, you succeeded. If you didn't succeed, I mean, if you didn't hit your quota, you didn't succeed, right? So it's, there isn't too much of ability to hide behind excuses or to have someone continue you in your job if that one metric is not very clear. Now, that said, you will need to be very motivated and a self-learner because uh, sales by definition means that you are typically operating on your own. Uh, you probably will come across new kinds of problems, things that even other sales rep may not have encountered. So you will need to create your own map of the world, if you will, and go find your answers. You're not going to get most things ready made for you. So you need to be somebody who is very okay with ambiguity with high pressure, something that's always on. Um, so th that's a couple of other things. A few other points that I can think of is today, because of the internet, uh, selling is no longer about informing the customer of what you have and trying to, you know, force it down their throat. Customers are able to do that research. And the point when they call you as a sales rep, they already have a fairly good idea. So you need to be able to do what is now called consultative selling, where you are not simply informing them of product features, etc., but understanding their business, talking their language and helping them understand what they need to future proof their business and thus how your solution or product fits into that. Right. So the ability to be consultative is also important. Um, a few other things I can think of are you need to be a person who's got high confidence. Rejections are part and parcel of the game in sales. I've seen many sales organizations and I can tell you that if you are able to find an opportunity in one out of three accounts that you talk to, and then you will be able to convert into revenue, which means into an order one out of those three, which means effectively only about one in 10 people or accounts that you talk to will actually convert to an order. So 90% rejection, 10% acceptance. You need to be somebody who is actually very okay with that. If you take it personally, if you believe that a rejection is an automatic sign of your incompetence or, and it affects your ego, you won't last very long in sales. Uh, you need to be somebody who is okay to negotiate. Negotiation is not a skill that comes naturally to most people. And it's a critical part of sales because obviously you want to sell it at the highest possible price and margin profits, whereas the customer wants to buy it at the lowest profit uh, possible price. So the ability to negotiate without losing your cool or without throwing in the towel is also important. And directly tied to that is the fact that most sales reps operate on previously the industry standard used to be a 70 30 pay, which means 70% of your pay is fixed and 30% of it is variable. But over the last few years, globally, the trajectory has been to move it to a 60-40. So 60% fixed, 40% variable. Uh, and it's my premise that the way the trend is going, it is very likely to be 50-50 in the next few years. So if you're not a person who's comfortable with having 50% variable pay, you know, this might not be the thing for you. Um, last couple of points I'd like to make on this. You need to be somebody who's okay with travel. And by that, don't necessarily think you will go to the most exotic locations and always stay in five star hotels, depending on the kind of sales you're doing. So if you're doing FMCG sales, you're very likely to visit tier two or even rural areas, right? You might have unpredictable hours because you might need, need to meet customers after their own regular business hours. So if you are somebody who likes fancy business class only travel, very predictable hours, sales may not be the thing for you. So again, this is not a, meant to be an exhaustive or comprehensive list, but these are just some of the things I think a good salesperson or anyone who wants to be associated with sales needs to have in them.
agree agree completely agree um, the, uh, one more thing that most people have in mind is uh, you know typically what is uh, a general career path that people follow in sales right so you know from uh, this is more from a post mba kind of a mm-hmm. role right so uh, your perspective on this yeah so um most people who come out of an mba will start as an individual sales rep right so depending on the industry you could be more technical you could be um, you know just simply selling toothpaste it doesn't matter but you will start out at an individual sales rep level which could be the sales consultant or sales uh, senior sales consultant take these designations with a pinch of salt because they vary significantly across companies uh, but essentially you will spend a couple of years doing an individual role where you are responsible to hit your number consistently the number could be monthly quarterly half yearly again depending on the company and if you don't do it you will lose your job or you will be asked to move out once you've done this for a few years or in some cases if you already have sales experience prior to mba you will get to the position of a sales manager where you have a team you may still have a quota that you need to hit while you are mentoring or coaching the other reps to hit their numbers or it could be the case that you are simply responsible to ensuring uh, you are simply responsible to ensure that the team hits its number right so that is a sales manager uh, a location sales manager might have multiple sales managers under him so he could be responsible for a geography so let's say south india sales uh, or you know asia pacific sales whatever and then a regional vice president or general manager is fairly high up who looks at multiple locations so somebody who is the sales head for india or sales head for asia pacific etc these would be the roles so if you think about it from a post mba career path you could expect to spend anywhere between 3 to 5 3 to 6 years as individual sales rep uh, maybe another 3 to 4 years as a sales manager so by the time you are about 10 years post mba you can expect it you can expect to become a location or a general manager and then depending on your performance it could be another 5 to 10 years to get to the position of a regional vice president or a general manager right again now uh, these numbers are all ba- ballpark i'm using broadly large multinational conglomerates uh, and a career path there as the benchmark if you were to join a startup or one of the newer industries this could be much faster but it also comes with the risk that the company doesn't do as expected and you know you might uh, stare at certain other problems in terms of pay and just the ability of the uh, of the company to survive right right um you touched upon this aspect on uh, you know different kinds of uh, sales role that people have right so mm-hmm. uh, just if you could just touch base on you know again categories of sales professionals right which is uh, maybe this could be different across different industries so a little bit on that uh, from you yeah i mean the way i look at this is i w- um i would call this more as you know uh, how different people succeed or fail in sales so there are what so let me start from the bottom so when you look at a lay down based seller who simply waits for the customer to come to them uh this kind generally no longer works unless you have like a really hot model uh of something uh, a really hot product or a service this is not going to work apple could be one of those where you know the customers go to the company so there are very few such companies most times there is some level of competition so you can't afford to be a lay down based seller a hands off seller is somebody who just send, sends out a email or Uh, maybe just makes a phone call and then depending on whether there is an opportunity passes along that lead to somebody who is more qualified within the company to take care of it so think of it as somebody calling you and saying uh, hey do you think you want to invest better and you say yes and they are like okay do you are you the sort who likes risk or um, are you the sort who is more conservative and you say uh, i think i am the sort who is very conservative and they are like okay let me connect you to our bond sales manager who will tell you of the different sort of products that come with low risk uh, profile so that's like a hands off seller a prayer based seller uh, frankly is 
again not somebody who is very desirable they keep meeting new people they keep creating new lead but they don't follow up right so that's uh, not something that is going to work very well a results based seller is somebody who uh, tries to focus and make as many sales as possible so they focus on uh, the attempts and converting everybody into an immediate sale again may or may not be desirable and finally a funnel based seller is the one who uses all the below four approaches to ensure that at any time he has customers at various stages some with whom he's just having the opening conversation some with whom he's closing the sale some with whom he's in the process of negotiating the final price somewhere he's in the proposal stage where he's sort of helping the customer understand how his product or solution product or service uh, solves the customer problem. So a funnel based seller basically has prospects across the entire funnel, uh, right? So this is uh, one way to think about it. Another way which is not there on this slide, but which I think is relevant for people to know is that a seller could be either a hunter or a farmer, right? So as the name indicates, a hunter is one who goes out and looks for new accounts. He looks to make an entry in companies and accounts and selling to people whom the company has never sold to before. A farmer on the other hand, looks at the fact that how do I sell more of what I have to my existing customer base? So if I again were to draw the example of let us say a, a bank, it could be about finding new customers for fixed deposits, that's hunting. Or it could be about how do I get my current customers to put more of their money into fixed deposits, which is the farming piece of it. So that's another way to think about sales professionals. Um, and if I have to talk about those in one level more detail, hunters, the job is more difficult, but also the payoff is higher. So typically hunters are paid more uh, versus farmers. Farmers is relatively easier because you already have presence in the account and now it's a bit of expanding the share of wallet within that account. Uh, but commensurately companies do not pay farmers as much as they pay hunters. Right. Uh, uh, Pradhak, you have, uh, you know, mentored so many students uh, so far in, mm -hmm. you know, in the last almost a decade, I would say. Yeah. Right. So what is your thought process on, you know, especially when we are looking at you know, typical traits that admission committee look for, right? More from the sales perspective. So, you know, say for example, there have been people like you mentioned who have been any of the categories of sales, maybe pre-MBA, uh, yep. as shown in the slide before, right? Mm -hmm. So in, in when they are actually trying to create the story or when they are writing their essays, uh, what is in your perspective, what do you think is something that adcoms would really want to look for or something that, uh, you know, would uh, you know make sense to them when they say they want a career in sales and say for example they say I want to become a sales manager or I, I want to head the business of some company so what are your thoughts around that and typically what are the three or four criteria in your view which make sense to admission committees okay so at the very start I would look at you know does the person have a past sales experience or not so in, if somebody has past sales experience, then what the company, uh, sorry, what the adcom would look for would be in terms of the depth of that experience, the quality of that work ex in terms of how long did they do it? What skills did they pick up? What, uh, how, how did they hit their goals? What did they learn about the sales process or an industry? Uh, that, that, and of course, why do they want to continue in that? particular line. What about sales excites them, motivates them? Why are they so passionate about it? Right? That's what would be looked at. If somebody doesn't have past experience in sales and wants to switch functions into sales, then what is looked for is what are the fungible traits or things that the person has got from their past that would be of use to them even in a sales career, right? It could be things like personality traits, such as being uh, having a very solid customer focus and understanding the ability to empathize and solve customer problems. So what, again, what skills do they bring from the past 
that can be translated for a successful sales career. Uh, very importantly, one of the things that any adcom specifically at the interview stage tries to look for is what is the why of what of your goal? What is your underlying passion or motivation for this field? Is it something superficial like, you know, the imagined glamour or is there a more thought out reason why you are looking to get into sales or for that matter, whatever your career choice would be. So it's your, what is your passion, your motivation? And finally, I've been on many interview committees, at least at ISB and for people who are looking to switch functions or industries, one of the things that the panel discusses at the end of the interview, once the person has left the room is, do we think this person has that X factor in them to make the change? So obviously we look at things like skills, prior work experience, quality, motivation, passion, etc. But also there is an element of subjectivity or just that gut feel of, do we think this person has that grit, resilience, that ability to, I won't, I don't want to use the word jugard, but somebody who has the ability to not simply take no for an answer and give up their dreams, but find some way, some path, even if it is a little roundabout to get to what they want. Do they have that X factor in them uh, is also something that all ad commission, uh, admissions committee look for irrespective of the kind of post MBA goal you have, but very specifically for sales because sales is one of those things where, as I mentioned, your lack of performance is very easy to find out. Unlike in some of the other fields, like for example, um, maybe consulting or many others where your manager's opinion of how you do your job matters. In sales, it doesn't. If you've hit your number, frankly, no manager get, wants to fire you, right? Uh, I just want to take one minute to talk about an anecdote I have to illustrate how powerful a sales rep can be. So in one of my past roles, I had to talk to a sales rep and get some information. And this person was totally non-responsive. And this was a fairly critical project that I was working on. So I escalated it to his manager and his manager simply told me, you please leave the guy alone, right? He's been with the company for uh, close to 10 years, right? So that's almost 40 quarters, four quarters in a year. He said that in his entire 10 years, the lowest the guy has ever done is 140% of his quota. His quota has been increased every single quarter and every single quarter he has performed. So I don't want him to get pissed off and leave us. In fact, he doesn't respond to my emails. That's his manager's emails. And he has told me, his manager, to never call him ever unless he misses his number. So I have not spoken to him in the last three years. Obviously, pay hikes come his way. He gets his base salary and commissions based on the sales he's made. So he's like, just leave me alone. So that's I know that's a bit of an extreme example, but it just goes to show you that if you're a good salesperson, you have a very, very high degree of job security in your own company. And even if not in your company, in your competitor's company, right? But on the flip side, if you don't hit your number, it's again, very black and white and you'll get kicked out. So that's why the motivation of why do you want to go into sales and will you be able to take this pressure week in, week out or quarter in, quarter out is something that any admissions committee will want to judge. So uh, one question over here, Pradyut, I had is uh, for someone who does not have a background in sales, say like, for example, a lot of uh, people that we, you know, speak to are either from a technology industry or say an right. application, uh, like a development background mm -hmm. or from a quality background. Do mm -hmm. you think they would be able to uh, justify a career in sales and what are your thoughts on what could they be focusing on uh, you know if they want to talk about a career in sales and does it even make sense for them at this point so again when you say sales uh, if somebody who has done let's say it development for 5 years if they want to go and do fmcg fast moving consumer goods sales now that's a little harder story to weave in terms of why are they passionate about it? What skills do they bring, etc. But if they want to go and become, let us say, farmers at the, uh, in an IT company where you know they're looking to bring to a customer more and more of the services 
of the uh, company that they work for that can make, that can definitely happen so let me give an, a more tangible example let's say somebody has worked in you know applications development for 5 years so they understand how technology works they understand the problems that a developer faces uh, they through the business school they understand the knowledge of how technology fits into a customer problem now can they join a company like a cognizant or infosys and try to get more business for cognizant and infosys in a client definitely in fact they have some critical knowledge which will help them which is they have done development so they understand some of the practical realities in terms of technological constraints time constraints not promising the customer too much giving adequate time for testing of the applications etc which somebody who is not spent time in the actual delivery of the product uh, can appreciate right so there is so the so that's why i'm saying that depending on the kind of prior experience you will need to tie that to your post mba career in sales so obviously same industry is easier if you want to go to a different industry then you need to spend adequate amount of time during your mba to learn about that industry and to identify what skills you have from the past that will hold you in good stead even when you switch industries right right so um, you know pradeep in your view right so uh, mm. you have you know post mba you have spent a considerable amount of time in the industry now right yeah. so at every point you might have faced uh, you know why an mba helped you or you know uh, did mm-hmm. it help you did it help your career or did it help you open doors when you are actually talking to customers or uh, you know did it uh, did isb give you the right network to get through uh, you know uh, say sales maybe or even connect to the right um, right kind of customers in your journey right so any thoughts on more uh, or the key learning from your mba journey like why do you think an mba made sense to you at that point and uh, how do you believe uh, that it has great impact uh, in your career even today So as i mentioned why mba at that point i kind of covered i was the only non mba in my team and there were certain gaps in my own way of operation that i felt an mba would be the most effective way to address now that i've been out of the school for over a decade um let me talk about how some of those things have actually translated to on these five dimensions right in terms of job search so my first job post mba uh, mba was a campus hire but every job since then has been through the isb network right even when i found the job opening elsewhere and i applied and i didn't get a response i contacted somebody from the isb network who was already in the company that i was looking to get a job at and they opened doors and ensured that i at least got an interview so depending on the school you go to the strength of the alumni network is very critical because that's that is something that will stand you in good stead throughout your working career um speaking for isb even though it is a one year school which means you don't have a senior or a junior batch it does have very strong community networks uh people are generally very helpful to look at any request that comes to them from an isb alum even now one of the isb alums who is based in uzbekistan is looking to bring some students from uzbekistan to singapore for some sort of a uh, you know visit and he asked me if i can organize a tour for them in my office i have never met this alum i graduated from isb in 2008 he graduated from isb in 2015 nearly a decade after but i'm currently working on how do i get his folks to come and visit us at dell and i can tell you that if that email that came to me did not come from an isb alum but just somebody who found out that i was working here in singapore i wouldn't have done that so the network from the school that you are in is very very critical on the second point around coursework coursework is important while you are there it um, is an indicator or a signal of your intellectual horsepower however beyond the point i would say after the first 5 years of your mba it doesn't matter so much because you learn so much more on your job 
right? Last year I looked at ISB's electives and there's hardly any intersection between the electives I did 10 years ago and what is there in the coursework now. Things like digital, um, artificial intelligence, data analytics, etc., were not even buzzwords at my time. Forget about being mainstream subjects. Today, they are all part of the coursework. So coursework, while important, it stands you in good stead in the first few years, but after that, you would have learned more on your job. Uh, and, you know, frankly, some of your coursework that you don't use, you will tend to forget. Extracurriculars, uh, again, most business schools have the ability to expose you to a wide variety of clubs and social interests. So definitely spend some time during your MBA to explore avenues and do things that you think um, that you don't naturally see a inclination for. So use it as a thing that you explore and broaden your own horizon uh, and try to persist with that even post MBA, right? So I have developed my own set of extracurricular activities even outside of MBA. And it's something that just keeps you as a more holistic, well-rounded person. Um, so that's on extracurriculars. Cost and expense, again, depending on the school, the cost can be fairly significant. Uh, the first couple of years post MBA can be quite, I won't say difficult, but it, it's unlikely to be raining money the way most people think it is. You would most likely have a loan that you need to pay back depending on your age. You may choose to get married, start a family, etc. post MBA. So you will have a whole bunch of front loaded expenses that will come there. So even though you might get a higher take home pay, you will also have higher fixed expenses every month. Um, if I were to think about it, I think the real financial payoff starts maybe six to seven years post an MBA, right? Again, it can vary uh, somewhat depending on how your post MBA career path progresses, but it's really after the first six to seven years that you have a good payoff in terms of your ROI uh, on the expense that you put in. In terms of a social life, uh, I'm still in touch with a lot of my MBA classmates. I was there at ISB uh, about 18 months ago for our 10th year reunion. In many ways, when I want a second opinion, I reach out to somebody from within the ISB network. If I want to bounce some ideas off, they could be from my batch, they could be from a different batch. Uh, there are regular get togethers across the world for ISB. Singapore has a very active alumni base. I think, in fact, after India, US, uh, Singapore has the highest number of uh, ISB alums. I think we are close to about 200 plus here in Singapore. So there's a fairly active uh, social life that's possible. So I think the MBA is, there is really more to this than just getting the degree and looking at it as a short term investment for, you know, hey, I'm bored with my job and I want to make a change and the best way for that is an MBA. Sure, that's one element of it, but there is much more to it. It's, it is something that will stay with you for life. So don't make that decision to do or not do an MBA lightly. Consider it in its entirety and then decide, one, do you want to do an MBA? And two, if so, from where? Because you're most likely going to do it once. You are not going to do this twice and you can never divorce your MBA, right? Once it's there, it's there with you for life, good or bad. So um, it's more permanent than a tattoo. So give it that good thought before you jump into it. Absolutely. I think I, I completely agree with that aspect. In fact, uh, you know, uh, what I would want to also add to what uh, Pradyot mentioned is uh, think through the whole process. Uh, what is more than trying to understand whether you fit into uh, a B school, you also need to make sure whether you know, an MBA fits into your plan, right? Because uh, you, right from what your background is to what you eventually want to do, I think you have to think through the entire aspect to make sure, uh, you know, this investment in terms of time, money, and uh, all prospects fits in perfectly into your career goals, right? So I guess that's also a very important aspect. Great. So what we'll do now is we'll take in questions. So all of you, you can just post in your questions on the Q&A window. I'll just take questions one by one. Uh, let me just start with the first one. Uh, it says, um, 
okay not very relevant to the sales aspect but i think it's important let me just take it up it says uh, is end of september october good enough to take gmat to apply to r2 and also for few schools in r1 does a good profile in gmat gmat score trumps a no work experience pradyo your thoughts on this uh so number one yes i think um, again i'm presuming that so let me take my own case i did my gmat in end of october october 31st i still remember the date i was an r2 applicant for isb and i got in right so yes september october is good enough for r2 even in most in all cases <coughs> excuse me and maybe round one in some schools does a good profile and gmat score trump no work experience um to me work experience is part and parcel of the good profile bit so if somebody has zero work experience but a great gmat score personally i would weight them lower than somebody who has a slightly lower gmat but some meaningful work ex and by meaningful i mean at least 18 to 24 months uh, so in my personal view i'm not answering on behalf of anyone else in my own view no work experience is not a good way Uh, to get into an mba i agree um i have one more question here so uh, a more relevant one uh, to this webinar uh, this is uh, harshit who says i have a, a b2b sales experience in an elevator company where my clients are builders i have one and a half years of experience i will have one and a half years of experience as a sales executive by the time i join an mba what kind of roles do you think i should target post mba and you know can i move to marketing rather than sales uh, you know post my mba sure and i think the fact that you would have had about 15 months uh, sorry 18 months of sales experience prior to mba will stand you in good stead irrespective of the kind of companies that you are looking at uh, in terms of what kind of roles i would say that if i'm presuming that with only one and a half years of experience as sales executive uh, you can at least aim for like a senior sales executive or even maybe like a first level sales manager in terms of shifting to marketing i think shifting from marketing to sales is a lot harder than shifting from sales to marketing right so if you've done sales moving to marketing is uh, relatively a good option and many marketers like sales because ultimately sales and marketing have to work together and i'll just address one of the other questions i saw is what's the difference between sales and marketing marketing is basically the messaging or the communication of your product or service to the customer right um again that's a very rough definition there are many nuances to it but it's essentially communicating the um you know the product the price how to get it and any promotions that are available to the customer so the four p's of marketing very roughly put are what marketing is sales is the act of getting your customer to open their wallet and give you their money in return for the product or service uh again a very rough answer but that will give you the essence this the marketer is the one who tells you that look i have this shiny new object for you to buy and if you want it you can go to your retail store and pick it up the seller is the person at the retail store who will ensure that when you come in he greets you he doesn't piss you off that he ensures you find the product on his shelf that you bring it to the checkout counter you open your wallet and make a payment right uh pradeep i have one more question interesting one um that's i have more than 10 years of experience in pharma sales but mm-hmm. not in a leadership role can an mba through gmat take me to a strategic role role in the same sector or as a brand manager in fact i would think this is the, the this is an mba will be the perfect stepping stone to move from doing pure sales to a leadership role either within sales or let us say pharma strategy because you understand the market you understand customers you understand pricing you understand the go to market having been in sales for 10 plus years which is a fairly significant time duration so yes an mba can definitely help you get to either becoming a sales manager getting to other roles within your own company could be strategy mergers and acquisitions could be uh, marketing etc 
or you could be a brand manager who is responsible for the profit and line uh, profit and loss of one line of business maybe uh, i don't know how it is set up in this particular company but it could either be one specific set of products or it could be a, a single medicine or something like that but yes definitely an mba seems to be the uh, seems to be a very good way to make that jump right right uh, pradeep i have one question here uh, mm-hmm. and this is something that lot of candidates ask us right now uh, specifically you know a lot of people say that sales is very uh, culture centric right so uh, when you are talking about a product in a specific country you know the way the uh, the target audience look at it might be different right so yeah especially since you uh, you know uh, studied in an indian uh, school and mm-hmm. uh, so you have had global experience across geographies uh, mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on this especially when it comes because it's a very client facing kind of a role and you kind of meet different kind of customers across different geographies reacting differently right so mm-hmm. what are your thoughts on you know uh, uh, this whole concept that sales is a very culture centric uh, uh, you know profile and if you have done sales in india maybe it's better to be in india rather than you know being globally and you have a completely different uh, you know perspective or experience on it your thoughts on that aspect yeah um i think this was maybe very true 20 to 30 years ago but today with globalization and you know international movement of professionals those boundaries are beginning to blur sure there are still certain nuances there are still cr- countries where price is a sensitive factor india is definitely a price sensitive market uh, but at the end of the day ultimately sales is about helping somebody pay money to solve a problem that they have right um so while there are country specific nuances at the end of the day it is about understanding the customer's problem figuring out what level of increased performance or solution are they looking for identifying a fit between your product slash service to the customer's need and positioning it appropriately in a way that ensures that the customer sees value for it um so while i i would not go so far as to say that uh, you know having sold only in india you can't make a successful switch elsewhere but the one boundary that continues to exist is language right so if you want to become a seller in germany you better be able to speak german right so if you're you could be the best sales rep but if you can't speak japanese you're not going to do anything in japan so language continues to be the biggest barrier for successful cross geography sales uh, but outside of that in terms of how customers are beginning to think of it especially when you're talking business to business large conglomerates i think there is more homogenization now than there was in the past right right um so especially in some asian countries uh, you know uh, especially say for example if, or, you know even if you're looking at sales in say uh, you know have you faced that in singapore you know or maybe uh, singapore not so much singapore is very multicultural um it has always been a country that has been open to trade and also having a huge uh, expat population right so of the 6 million presently in singapore i believe about 3 million are citizens 1 million are permanent residents and 2 million are expats wow. so singapore you would in fact on some days we joke that we don't even make out we are outside of india because we see so many indians uh, the weather is like that of chennai there is no dearth of indian food you have all your kirana stores that will sell you your groceries uh, the only thing is it's a little cleaner and public transport is more efficient but but for those two when i'm just inside my house as i am right now i could be in india or anywhere else so singapore honestly you don't feel any culture difference uh us another geography where i've worked english is the de facto language uh barring some political changes in the recent past by and large it's a country that's been open to immigrants it's a melting pot so again you won't see such a difference however germany where i worked it was imperative for me even though i wasn't even doing sales while i was in germany i was doing a different role 
it was important for me to blend in and I did have to pick up some basic German. And if I were to stay there and I actually have a colleague of mine from ISB who is in, uh, who is selling in Germany now, and he is proficient in speaking German now. He went there, he learned it. It's been 10 years. He speaks absolutely fluent German, right? So again, depending on the geography, you will need to learn the language, but the fundamental selling skills and the fundamental human psychology is the same. People are willing to pay if you can increase convenience, if you can uh, increase their happiness, right? So for one of these two people are willing to pay and that psychologically is similar no matter where they are. It is the language you need to, in order to reach them and convince them that when they give out their money, they will see that happiness or the convenience. Absolutely. That's so well articulated. <laughs> it fits in perfectly with what exactly, uh, you know, the industry is all about, right? So uh, one, another inter interesting question that we have is, um, so someone's saying I'm already, you know, in a manufacturing sector in a sales manager role, and I want to move to a, a FMCG sector. Do you think an MBA can help me do that? Uh, yes, I mean, see, there are all sorts of career switches that have happened in MBA, right? So if I look at ISB has, I think now over 10,000 students and I'm just taking ISB, which is just one school in the world. Can I find examples of somebody who is moved from manufacturing to FMCG? Uh, I'm sure I can, right? So are there people who must have tried it and probably did not make it quite likely as well? So it's more a question of how do I make that transition happen? So yes, can it happen? Yes. What do you need to do is the question you need to ask. You need to ensure that if you want to make the move to FMCG sales, you need to understand why are you trying to make that transition? What about the FMCG sector interests you? And then depending on where you want to do the FMCG sales, because FMCG sales in the US is going to be a different ball game from FMCG sales in India. Today, FMCG sales in India is all about expansion into tier two, tier three and rural markets, right? Bombay, Delhi, Bangalore have all been penetrated enough. It is really about selling into the bottom part of the pyramid. So uh, if, if that is something to your interest and your passion, then you need to ensure that you build up the skill set. You need to learn about the demographics, uh, psychographics and the economics that work in tier two and rural India you need to uh, pick up maybe specific skills through maybe uh, projects, maybe some sort of research during your time at MBA in order to demonstrate that you have the knowledge and skills to make that successful transition. It's a little bit like asking, can a bowler become a batsman? Yes, they can, but then they need to pick up a different set of skills. Right. Cool. So thanks, guys. Uh, I think that gets us to the end of this webinar. Thank you, uh, Pradyot, for such an awesome session. I think it was uh, exceptionally informative, uh, you know, to and it helped all of us get an understanding of what it takes to get into a role uh, focused on sales. Uh, all of you, uh, all those who are attending this webinar, I have posted a few links on the chat window. Uh, we have an MBA Kickstarter kit. kit. Uh, you could just use Crack MBA 2019 and use this. This has a compilation of videos on post MBA career goals. Uh, I've also put a link on how we can help you with applications. And we have mentors such as Pradyot on our board who can help, uh, you know, in the entire application process, specifically for, uh, you know, people who are applying for, uh, you know, any global kind of a role. Uh, and with that, uh, I also want to let you know that we have uh, another webinar coming up today at 7.30. This is on supply chain. Uh, the speaker works for Apple in the supply chain industry in the Bay Area. So uh, I, want, I would love all of you to please attend the supply chain webinar too. That will give you a great understanding of uh, you know, what it takes to get into supply chain too. So thank you so much, Pradyot. Um, uh, the, uh, we really value your time and uh, thank you so much for being part of this webinar and helping students understand a lot about uh, you know how to focus on careers post MBA. Glad to have uh, been able to share some of my experience and I just want to wish everyone uh, who attended the very best. I hope you found something of value in today's uh, uh, discussion uh, and really good luck for the GMAT, MBA and even life beyond. Thank you so much Pradyo. Thank you guys.
See you. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Bye bye. I'm good.